Hey everyone, it's George Kroos and welcome back to the Innovators Mindset Podcast. This is episode three of the highlights from 2022 for the Innovators Mindset Podcast. And the theme of today's episode is really about risk-taking. And as you all know, uh, my family and I, we all moved to um, Orlando, Florida this past year and it was a huge risk. Uh, and when I talk about that, I have conversations about this often on, on why we did it. And it wasn't that things were bad where I lived. In fact, things were good. And what I often say when we talk about risk is that risk is moving from a comfortable average in pursuit of an unknown better. And so when I think about kind of how I felt while I was living there, I was like, yeah, this is good. This is all right. (laughs) And that's just kind of how I felt. And so I'm looking for that space that pushes me to that next level And it's not that, you know, things are bad. Sometimes things are good, but how do we get to that great level? And it means that we have to challenge ourselves. We have to try things. So when we hear that term risk, we often connect it with danger. But in reality, it is moving from that that comfortable average and, and seeking out things so that we continuously grow, that we continuously get better in our practice. And I just shared, I just wrote about this in a blog post. One of the things that I asked my own daughter, Kalia, I said, um, do you miss anything about living home? She's like, absolutely nothing. And she said, I get to spend more time with you. And to me, that was everything, right? That's, we risk to make our lives better. We risk to create open, you know, and open doors for our kids, whether it's our family, the students we serve. That's why we take risks is we're constantly trying to get better, that we learn from all that we've done. And you'll see kind of um, in this podcast, you'll see the guests, really hit this 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 point home and I know you're gonna love it thank you so much for joining me again on the highlights from 2022 from the innovators mindset podcast this podcast is inspired by mama Kuros. <laughs> by my mom my mom taught me this and I, I was thinking about this and how relevant um, and how how impactful this advice um, my mom gave me when I was a kid. And I've always stuck with it. And it's something that I think about all the time is that just what is the worst thing that can happen if you ask someone for something you want? It's probably that they can say no. And it's better, um, it's better to ask and hear no than to not ask and never know, if that makes sense. And that's something that my mom really instilled in me and something I've kind of carried forward into my life. And a lot of times when I'm, you know, people will reach out to me, they say, I got a podcast, blog, books, all that other stuff. And they'll say, oh, like, I'm nervous to ask this, but like, would you be on my podcast? I'm like, of course, why wouldn't I be? Right. And it's such an honor when people, you know, want to have conversations with me. And it's kind of always funny. And sometimes, you know, I do have to say no, because I'm limited in time. Um, but you know, I, I, I always want, if I can, I try to give, you know, people my time as freely as possible. Uh, and I think it's partly because I really love connecting with people. That's one thing, but I also (laughs) don't want to be the person that scares them from asking again. Right. And, um, if, if you ever, you want something in your life and you don't get it, it doesn't mean you don't try again. It doesn't mean that you give up. And I know as an administrator, how, um, how discouraging can be. And I know that a lot of times, especially in education, teachers want to try something new. Uh, they want to like do something powerful and, um, they go talk to their administrator and the administrator says no. And the no affects the person that asked, but it also affects all the people that know that person asked because they're like, well, I'm not going to try anything because the, the administrator will say no. So I try in my life to say yes as much as possible to others if in any way I can help them, right? And I, like I said, I, it's not always possible, but I, I, I do want to do that. So um, I think that's something that I want to embody in myself. But it's also something, something that, as I said, my mom, my mom, Mama Kuros, <laughs> really instilled in me too. And I, I want to talk about this, how it's really impacted me professionally. I want to share a story and not everyone knows a story, but, uh, when I was a principal, I, I, we were doing some really interesting things in our school. 
And I felt that the stuff that we were doing in school, I would love to share with um, the entire school district. I thought, if this is good for the students in our school. How can I help to instill it, you know, give these opportunities to every kid in every school in our district? And um, what would be a way to do that? So I actually call, contacted my superintendent, uh, Tim Mons at the time. And I, I said, hey, I, I'd love to meet with you. I have an idea. I just want to kind of go through it. And so I um, said to him, and I just, I can't really remember the whole conversation, but I remember the whole premise of it. I said, you know, I think that in, in our school district, in our school, we're doing some really interesting things. And I, I would love to see it, you know, kind of spread throughout the entire district. And I actually think that my focus on innovation, how we use technology in meaningful ways, is something that everyone would benefit in our schools. And I also think that there should be someone at the central office level who's implementing these things because we're always talking about, we're preparing kids for jobs that don't exist, but we're doing it in jobs that currently exist. We need to start rethinking some of the positions that are in our schools. So I think that not only should we create a new position that supports this type of learning in our schools, but I also think I'd be the best fit. And I think I could do a great job. But that being said, even if you didn't think I was the best fit, I still think the job should exist. I still think that we need to start rethinking some things in our schools. And I remember Tim saying, all right, and kind of smiling at me. And it was kind of like, eh, whatever. This is like, I, I can't just make a new job. And that's what I felt. And I walked away from the meeting. I'm like, hey, didn't work out. I, I, you know, at least I asked. My mom taught me to do that. At least I asked. It's about two months after that meeting, he contacted me. Or actually, he didn't even contact me. We were at an event. He said, hey, I just need to talk to you for a second. And he pulled me out of the meeting. He said, uh, you know that job that you brought up? I think it's a good idea. I think we're going to move forward with it. Now, whether you become an entrepreneur in terms of opening a business, you should become an, an entrepreneur and in understanding that you are a business of one. And what do I mean by that is, mm -hmm. let's say let's say you're an educator. You go to your district and you soak up every piece of PD they offer. If it's letters training, if it's order getting ham, if it's Schoology, if it's Canvas, whatever, you soak it up and you take those skills you make them applicable to what you're doing and you put them aside in your toolkit, right? You are a business of one. And right. when your district no longer serves you, right? Don't be afraid to leave and go somewhere else and you take those skills that you've learned from them for free right. somewhere else. Now, whether that becomes you starting your own consulting company, you're going to go work for Canvas as, as a, a trainer for them, uh, or you just move again, move on to another school district where their values more align with yours, or where where you can see a, 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 a clearer path for growth for yourself. You do that, but we have educators as well as other workers who languish in jobs, right? Because they get attached to the job, they get attached to the paycheck, and not understanding as a business of one, you actually are in control of where you go, right. because your employer will let you go when it is best suited for them, right? Yep. Or yep. if, for example, a school district, which, you know, normally we don't, you know, school districts normally are not the places where you hear about a lot of uh, job cuts. However, when budget cuts come, you could be the one on the chopping block because they don't have the money for your salary. A lot of times we're asking, we're constantly talking about educators, you know, being you know, for uh, blah, 21st century and all that crap, right? We always yep, say this yep. stuff. And then, but then we like, we just want leadership to be the same way it was, right? And so, you know, just like, let's let's change the paradigm and the, the dynamic of, like, think about all the times we've changed the, you know, we try to think about different ways, like think about the teacher's facilitator and yeah. like, by principal is just the principal, right? But yep. so we're never asking that to change. So like, how do you see that, you know, role evolving? Um, in education? Well, I, I think 
I think it is evolving. It mm-hmm. Definitely, we're realizing, and I think more and more school districts, anyways, here in in Ontario, are realizing the importance of investing in that, and that maybe we kind of miss, we kind of missed the boat for a long time when it came to that because. Right. And, and and in the evolution of the role, right, the, the administrator was was the manager, right? right? So you do the budgets and whatever, make sure the toilets worked and whatnot. But now it's become a lot more of a, of a leadership, right, versus a, a manager. And right. a leader is that's completely different. To me, leadership is developing others, right? Right. So it, it doesn't matter if it's kids or if it's the staff. It's 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 all about what can I do as a leader. And what can I put into place? What budget do I need? How do I need to spend my budget? Everything, everything that's planned and that you're going to plan as a sc- as a school leader, is based on how can I make, you know, the people that are in my building grow and myself uh, mm-hmm. within that as well. So a lot of people aren't 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 uh, comfortable with that mm-hmm. because you don't know what you don't know, and often like teaching, you you know you know how you teach how you've been taught. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, you'll know school principles when you were a teacher, and you'll most likely start you know, being an, 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 an administrator, like what you've experienced. So, you know, a lot of people are focused on the mechanics of the job when we should be focused on the mechanics of the relationships. Well, the, the, right? so the, the, there's like a Covey, um, there, there's like a Covey thing that leadership is about, I mean, you said that leadership is about people, management is about stuff, but you actually have to have both skills, right? Exactly. So for example, you have this vision for all these incredible things that you want to do. Yeah. But then you don't have the the actual management skills to place the resources in the hands of the people that you want to think different. So it's not like a, I think a lot of people because you always see that 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 little thing that we say and oh it's, we don't need managers we need leaders. I'm like no 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 yeah, you yeah. need both. You actually you need, need both. both. You need you need both of those skills because basically you have this vision for what we try to do, but you actually have to have the skills and the tools to put those things in place. I pulled up actually. An old article I wrote. And I'm gonna. I'm curious. I'm gonna ask you about these questions I asked. And I'm because here's here's a reason I, um, and I, I just want to know what you think of them because when you work in educational technology, you're even though, and this is something I always say, is that a lot of times you're not trained for this, but a lot of times you spend your time fixing crap. Like let's be honest, it's not just the learning stuff. It's yeah. you, and like there's there's some value to this too, um, but it isn't what you're supposed to do, right? It is like you're supposed to focus on learning. Um, and so you are dealing with IT departments. And I think a lot of times people in this space, one of the frustrations is their IT department, right? And uh, there's a terminology called um, FUD. It's actually called fear. And, and actually, once I share this to you, don't just limit this to, to IT. This actually happens a lot in the world. Uh, FUD is actually stands for fear, uncertainty, and doubt. So for example, if you ask your IT department, like, hey, we want to try this thing. Oh, that's like a safety issue. And a lot of people are like, well, if it's a safety issue, then I'm not doing it. And they just like, they just live that, right? But I actually, you know, when I started working, I'd be like, well, tell me how it's a safety issue. And then they were kind of thrown off, right? Like, like you need to, di- like, I need you to explain this to me because I actually understand this stuff, right? And sometimes, like, I think more and more people have, I wouldn't say an IT background, but are comfortable with technology who understand learning, where I think, Years ago, we had a bunch of people really good with technology that, you know, did the frameworks and made decisions for teachers and said, here's what you get, right? So um, in your work with IT departments and kind of going through that and kind of be like, have you ever felt like a um, almost like a liaison, maybe like, maybe it's the wrong term. And by the way, IT department people have the hardest job. I, they're not, maybe not the hardest job. They have the most ungrateful job. Nobody ever calls the IT department at the end of the day and says, hey, the internet worked all day. Thanks. Nobody's <laughs> ever done that well, right? So they never get kudos that they deserve. You know, they only hear when crap goes wrong. So did you did you ever feel like you were like a mediator between staff and IT? Always. 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 Okay. Yeah. Okay. I actually uh, tell a story in the book of how uh, a friend of ours, um, Eric Kwong, uh, yeah. he is the IT um, director, so to speak, at a district I work with. And we will walk classrooms together. And we both learn so much from each other. Mm. Uh, I have learned why and how uh, certain, uh, you know, certain tech uh, logistics are possible or not, or what might be a better hardware for something or whatever. And then he learns, oh, this is what the teachers actually need to do. Now I know what to research to make sure it works with our infrastructure, et cetera. 
Um, And it has been an amazing learning experience. Uh, He's not a trained teacher. He's trained in IT. I'm not trained in IT, but I need to know what's possible. And when I have administrators from other schools, for example, saying, oh, well, my IT person told me we can't do that. Okay, well, let me uh, let me call someone and and, uh, and have the verbiage for you to talk to them because maybe they just don't know or. Yeah. Or have the FUD. They have the FUD. I should right. say. Right. And the in the FUD, like when you when they do this, they'll say, Oh, like I remember saying to IT person, I gotta tell you the story. And then I may be outing a district right now. Um about this Wi-Fi. And uh one time I was well, first a little preamble. There's um when when you're saying things like, Oh, that doesn't fit with our infrastructure, one of the things I would say to my IT department, and like the last person I worked with out of my school district was amazing. He like I like you know, hey, this doesn't work in our infrastructure, so we're going to have to change our infrastructure because we need to figure out how to make it work. <laughs> like, that's how he was. Like, it wasn't me. It was him, right? Wow. And I learned a lot that's from great. that process, right? And I think that's powerful. But I think one time, um, I remember actually going to a school district, and I'm curious if you've ever had an experience like this. So I'm speaking at the school district, and I said, hey, like, uh, I would really want the teachers, like, sharing, you know, tweeting so I can see what they're thinking while I'm speaking. And they're like, oh, the, well, the teachers don't have access to the wi-fi in the school i'm like what do you mean they don't have access to wi-fi I'm like well we don't give that out to teachers right i'm like what i'm like i'm like maybe you should have researched me before you brought me here right <laughs> like i'm not i might be trouble today right so i said well hey i really need it for the day can we just like give teachers the password yeah. and so they have access i need access because of the stuff i'm doing so if you don't have if you don't allow me internet access this is gonna be a really tough day right so they gave it to me reluctantly right the it department and then, uh, so they gave me the password. I said, hey, I'm just gonna throw the password up on the screen so everyone could just see it and they get access to it. And I, I, I know, I think I could tell you know where I was going. They said, no, 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 don't do that. They went to every teacher in the room, grabbed their device and logged on for them because they were like, there's no wow. way we're telling these people the password. And wow. I was like, really i'm like you are you are basically phasing yourself out of a job because people are going to say i'm not using this because it's too much hassle and then if they don't use it then what are you doing if they don't use it then they're like we don't need this technology is that like is that is that like a shocking story that i just shared no sadly no no it's not right i think a lot of times when we think you know about the risks that we take we think about what can we lose from this if we walk away from this opportunity if we walk away from this thing what are we going to lose from this but I don't think we think enough, and I, I certainly wasn't. We don't think about what could I gain if I walk away from this. What could I act? What? How could this make my life better? And what could I gain from this? And I think a lot of times we talk about regret. We talk about things that we did. But if you look back on your life and you think about opportunities that you didn't take advantage of, I, I guarantee you'd find a lot of regret there. And I would love to say I jump on every opportunity. I talk to every person that I wanted to talk to, you know, but I've done it a lot. I've, I've jumped on opportunities. I, I, I've learned over the years that it's always great to ask a question, even when it's most likely you're going to get a no, just to kind of put yourself out there and share those ideas. Cause you just never know what possibly good thing could happen. So as you're kind of, as I'm kind of talking through this and sharing, I think about some of the risks that I was willing to take to move away from things that not were not necessarily making me miserable, but weren't making me happy, that weren't bringing joy to my life each day. And I don't necessarily think that every job in the world should, like every kid should follow their passion. I think that when we talk about career, I think, you know, some people, a job is what they make money with and that's it. And everything else in their life is what brings them joy. And, and that's awesome. If that, if that's what gets them up in the day, that's great. I love that. But I I know there's sometimes that I think back on when I think back on me taking that risk that I, I didn't know if I'd ever be in education. I just knew that if I stayed, I would hate it. I would hate what I was doing. And so I took that risk. And recently, I was speaking at a conference and I, I'm going to tell you, getting up on stage and doing a keynote, I love it. I, I honestly remember watching, um, I remember watching somebody do it 
when I was, you know, a teacher and uh, speaking, I'm like, I'd like to do that one day, <laughs> but never really thought about it. Like, I was just like, that, that looks cool. And that was it. It was basically all that happened out of that thought. And I remember being in that keynote and doing this, and I almost felt like I had this out of body experience. And I just kind of looked and I, I just kind of looked, I'm like, crushing this this is like so good you are just doing such a good job i just felt like everything my timing was really good um the audience was really excited about what i was sharing i could just feel the energy and it was like i was getting giving energy to the audience the audience was giving energy back to me and for me there was just no better feeling than in that moment to feel i am i am like doing something that i am truly meant to do I just feel it. I just feel this emotion right now. And there are so many things that I did, and I, I still do, to get to that point. The way that I go and study speakers, um, the way that I, you know, I watch, like, I still watch videos of, like, you know, TED Talks and, you know, Jim Valvano. I watch Jim Valvano's videos a million times. I, I just love the way he delivers things. Because I don't see it as just something I do. I see it as an art form. And I, I want to just do, just make that art as meaningful as possible. Um, the connections I made, the stuff that I, you know, read, the way that I write about stuff that I eventually talk about. And the reason I, I write about it is so I can kind of like dive through it in my mind. The reason I do some of these podcasts is so I can kind of dig into ideas and I can just kind of like work through my ideas so that when I, they get to a place where I'm presenting them on a stage, they're just really refined. and and thought out. So there are a million things that I can point to that I do to have got to that point where I feel this is just something I love doing. This is just where I'm meant to be. And I'll tell you, there's just literally no better feeling than that. That and, and not only that, this is where I'm meant to be, but I'm I'm good at this. Like I'm really good at this and I love it. And I'm proud of that. And I know that sometimes, you know, some of you might be, oh, he's just bragging. Now. Yeah, I am bragging. I, I've worked really hard to do this. And I think that if, you, if you're offended that I'm proud of something, then are you offended when kids are proud of something they do? We encourage kids to, you know, be proud of when they, they know they've done something right. I don't think I'm better than anyone or anything like that. What I do think is I found something that I love that I just feel I'm, I'm really good at. 